Good morning. This is uh, Thursday, April 1st, 2021. Um, and we are here this morning discussing S-99, a bill which would eliminate the statute of limitations for child physical abuse, similar to a bill that we passed three years ago, I believe, that would eliminate the statute of limitation for child sexual abuse. We have a number of witnesses here this morning who are going to uh, relate some of their experiences. Um, and if they want to not use last names, it's fine with us. Um, but it's up to each individual. I see on the on the audio on the screen we've got some people's last names and others we don't. And that's whichever you'd like. We have Mark Wenberg, and I'm going to give a little credit to Senator Chris Pearson. Uh, who um, has been dogged on this bill and has, um, uh, I think, worked with you, Mark, to set up this morning's testimony. So I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Uh, I'm Dick Sears, State Senator of Bennington County, and I ask the rest of the committee to introduce themselves to all the witnesses. Alice Nitka, uh, Windsor County. Jeanette White. Caledonia County. Jeanette White, Wyndham County. And Phil Baruth, uh, like Chris, I'm also from Chittenden County. Mark, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Senator Sears, and thank you, uh, committee members. Uh, my name is Mark Wenberg, and I also want to thank uh, Senator Chris Pearson for being a, a strong advocate for this legislation and for you all uh, for taking the time this morning to consider this legislation and also to listen to some of the participants of the restorative inquiry into St. Joseph's Orphanage. Um, we have a total of nine folks who wanted to uh, share their testimony this morning, and I'm not sure I see. I don't sure I see them all, so I may, after my presentation, just jump off the screen to try and reach out to those folks who are also on my list, just to make sure they got the right link. Um, uh, before uh, turning, people, it would be helpful if anyone who's not speaking right now could mute themselves so that we don't hear. Um, just thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, before turning to their testimonies, I wanted to briefly share some information about the inquiry. Uh, the St. Joseph's Orphanage Inquiry uh, was launched in 2019 as an initiative of the Burlington Community Justice Center. The Justice Center contracted me in May of that year to collabor collaboratively design and facilitate the inquiry. And the inquiry is guided by an advisory team comprised of community stakeholders, and restorative inquiry participants. The restorative inquiry's mission is to understand and document the events of the orphanage through the voices, experiences, and stories of those most impacted, the former children, and then facilitate inclusive processes of accountability, amends making, learning, and change. The inquiry is guided by a set of restorative principles and values that inform all of our work including our primary obligation, which is to facilitate to the best of our abilities, the individual and collective goals of the former residents of the orphanage. Changing the statute of limitations on physical and emotional abuse is one of the group's core goals and objectives. I would like to thank Senator Sears and Senator Pearson and others for supporting the funding for this initiative in fiscal year 2022 which should enable the group to accomplish the majority of their projects and goals. I'd also like to thank the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services and Attorney General's Office for their co ongoing commitment to this project and process. Finally, I want to acknowledge what a privilege it is to work with the inquiry participants who are a constant source of inspiration to me. I'm going to now turn it over to Brenda Hannon, one of the spokespeople for the Voices of St. Joseph's Orphanage who will present a statement from the group. She will then be followed by individual, individual testimonies of the nine members present, including herself. And then we can finish with any questions that you have. And like I say, I'm just gonna, if I don't see some folks, I may reach out to them just to make sure that they, ha they have the right link. And so That's I- fine, I Mark. Um, we've got approximately an hour and- uh... Great. Thank you, Senator Sears again. And I turn it over to Brenda and I'm gonna mute myself. Good morning, Brenda. Good morning, Senator Sears. Good morning. We are very grateful 
to be a part of this legislative process and for you addressing this bill so quickly. The Voices of St. Joseph's Orphanage appreciate you giving your time to listen to us and support our goal to change the civil statute of limitations for physical, mental, and emotional abuse suffered at institutions. This bill will mean so much to all of us and will help in our healing to know this statute can no longer be used to hide abuse of any kind. By the passing of this bill, we leave behind a legacy to know all our abuse and suffering will have accomplished some good. I'm sure we can all agree to the fact it should be far more important to protect children from abuse than it is to protect those who abuse them. The adverse childhood experiences that children go through last a lifetime. We, the voices of St. Joseph Orphanage, are living testimony as to that damage that ACES does to the young developing mind. It has affected most of our lives for many, for many negative ways. For most, life has been a struggle. I would like to answer a few of the questions and points you brought up on your Friday's meeting. Number one, Mary Kehoe pointed out, we are hoping you can expand the language of the current or future legislation so children abuse both physically and emotionally um, may have access to justice. Number two, the Catholic Church did cover up all the sexual and physical abuse that occurred at St. Joseph's Orphanage. Make no mistake about that. They actively participated in the fraudulent concealment of evidence then and to this very day. They intimidated and threatened us with more harm to keep us quiet. The church and Vermont Catholic Charities are still refusing to release our complete and unredacted records. A point on medical records is UVM Medical Center has some medical records back as far as about 1964 with missing information in them. A lot of the abuse to us took place before that date. Also, they very seldom sought medical care for us so there will be no medical records of evidence on most of the abuse. Reporting by the nuns to the church, Vermont Catholic Charities and DSW was also very lax. Again, not much documented evidence left behind. Number three, I'm at number four, I'm sorry. From Kim's testimony, psychological and emotional abuse has been documented, documented to have delayed disclosure of the events for at least 52 years. This is actually very true for many of us. Number five, attempted, quotes, assault in our opinion is actually counterintuitive to what we are trying to accomplish with this bill. And hopefully you can strike that word. Number six, from Sarah's uh, Robinson statement, access to records needs to be recognized somehow in this bill. We are still trying for access. She also said with physical abuse, there is a bigger aspect of emotional abuse. With our testimony today, you will witness this ongoing emotional abuse trauma many of us carry to today. Thank you very much. Mark? Thank you, Brenda. So we're gonna begin with individual testimony now and we'll, um, there are a couple folks additional folks who I think are going to yep. come on. I just reached That's out to fine. them, but I'll start it off with uh, Michael. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Uh, hello, and thank you for allowing me to give my testimony today. I was in St. Joseph's Orphanage from June of 1973 to June of 1979. Uh, during the seven years I was there, I was physically, emotionally, and sexually assaulted. The cruelty was on a daily basis and did not end until I left the orphanage. As a result of this abuse, I suffered from PTSD, anxiety disorder, and panic attacks. Uh, I find it difficult making connections 
at a personal at a personal mm -hmm. level. Uh, I suffer from ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, uh, from childhood that carry over into adulthood that actually have a physical effect on the brain development. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like to see the statute of limitations change to hold accountable those people and institutions who either inflicted or by reason of an action allowed to be inflicted physical abuse on children. This cannot be allowed to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're going to go. Michael. Uh, we're going to go now to Mora. You're muted, Mora. Of course I was. I'm sorry. Hi. Thank you for allowing us to come in. Um, my name is Maura LaBelle, and I was there for six months, 1961 of June to 1961 of December, along with three other siblings this age. My father was a serviceman, and my mom had one baby on the way. So we were taken away and brought into the orphanage by the state and Catholic charities. We were allowed to go home on weekends. We were promised to be loved, cared for, and well-fed. We were none of the above. I witnessed a death. Um, I was also brought in a boat because of this death and threatened that, and I was only three and a half. It was unbelievable. I would see kids being kicked by nuns' heavy shoes. Sometimes they wore those black boots. Literally kicked and abused and made kids scream and holler throughout the night. And I would get up at three and a half and run for their he to help them because they were screaming and crying, help me, help me. Nobody was helping them. So I got out of bed and would run. And every time I ran, I was locked in a closet for getting out of bed. It was a horrific six months traumatizing in my life. My whole life was totally upside down. Not to mention the little boy that was killed was African-American. I do want you to know that these nuns came from Quebec, Canada into this country to run a nurse, uh, a nursery for St. Joseph's. And these people had a horrific background. They were running the duplicitous, ch duplicitous children and they were horrifically trained and allowed to come here and destroy children. It was legal there. I don't know how they were allowed here. What is What was wrong with our system? Nobody came and checked on us. Nobody. And we were totally destroyed. And how would that affect the statutes today? These people would have been in jail had these statutes had not been there. You think about that. These nuns got away with murder and able to go back to Canada. And no matter what happens, they got away with it scot-free. And how did that affect my life? I spent all my life looking for answers because the system failed us. I did all the looking myself. Here I am, 63 years old, and I spent my whole life, you know what I did with my life? These little dolls, I don't know if you can see them in my background because it's so dark, but I have several dolls, no adult figure of the dolls, just little ones. I'm gonna save the children because the authority figures couldn't save them. Nobody helped us. I hug all the kids. I love all the kids and I'm gonna care for them. Where were you guys? This is horrible. But I am so grateful that you're here now and I'm alive to see it. Thank you. I was muted. Uh, thank you, 
Um, I'm sorry for the on that. Good morning. Uh, John. Good, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. My name is John Magnago, and I live in Miami, Florida. I was born at Fannie Allen Hospital in 1943, where my mother left me at birth and then was incarcerated at St. Joseph's Orphanage at age four months. I remained there for seven years, after which I was adopted. There are many stories from us, the voices of St. Joseph's, the survivors of the orphanage, the stories of abuse, mental, physical, and sexual. For example, there were many, many means of punishment we were locked in dark closets or in dark attics for hours listening to other kids cry. I remember being one of those kids. I recall being taken by a priest to a separate room where he would sit down in a chair and put me under his robe, under his habit, and force me to open my mouth under there. I was whacked on the head if I did not perform as he wanted, and of course brainwashed that I'd go to hell if I told anyone. I can only assume I was six or seven years old. What does a kid know about what is happening except that he doesn't like it or want to do it? I specifically remember one really traumatic episode of being naked on and face down on, in a room. An older, heftier boy was straddling me, sitting on my backside and trying to rape me. At the same time, a man, priest, I'm not sure which, was holding my head down on the floor and telling me to be quiet while the, bu while the bully kid did his thing. And the man, priest, I slash priest, egged him on. While kicking and screaming, the man, priest, held my head down and banged my head against the floor so as to submit to the abuse. I was so traumatized that I was in the infirmary hospital for weeks. Because of that concussion, I still get these sharp pains on the left side of my head. Where are my medical records? I've asked and gotten nowhere as usual. This was just months before I was to be placed with my prospective adopted parents. According to my adopted parents, the story was that I was hit by a ball while playing with other kids, and therefore the placement was moved ahead a few months for my recovery. I know my testimony is rather strongly worded and you may think it is too much. However, at my age, I have nothing to hide and nothing to lose. I've lied and hidden the facts all my life to protect myself and at the same time protected the hypocrisy of the church and its accomplices. Truth be told that the hypocriti hypocritical church orphanage destroyed so many lives, including mine. Seriously, they have destroyed my ability to have a relationship. And at age 77, I, I have no family and fear I will die alone. It is a real shame that the church, which preaches family values, morality, et cetera, et cetera, have for decades and probably centuries abused and molested its young, innocent, and vulnerable children. It is despicable, deplorable, and disgusting. And I could just go on and on how these predators, men of God, can stand up in front of their flock, their congregation, and preach all their holy sermons, I don't know. We, the voices of St. Joseph, know, knows what it's like to have lived and especially to have survived the abuse at the orphanage where care of the children was the last thing on their mind. To this day, the church refuses to admit abuse, release personal files, and provide for restitution. Bishop Coyne, in September of 2018, 2018, said they were working with the authorities and, and providing transparency and have turned over all their records. Not at all true. In my... Pardon for what I have to say, but in my opinion, the church and all its clergy accomplices must be learning, leaning to the extreme right. 
the church accepted some $25 million from the Trump administration. Did you see or hear of the church opening its doors for the cold, the hungry, the unemployed, the homeless during this pandemic with the $25 million? Do you hear of them opening up food banks and distributing food and necessities to its flock, to its congregation, or to anyone in need? The answer to my knowledge is no. It is imperative that the statue of limitation be removed. A crime is a crime is a crime, period. There should never ever be a limitation on any crime. Where is their justice? Please tell me. Thank you for letting me tell you only one of the many horrific stories from the orphanage. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, you'll find some friends and compatriots among your group of the survivors, um, St. Joseph's and Mark. Uh, hopefully you're helping to do that. And, uh, I'm particularly struck by your testimony, John. I was born in 1943 also. And I was born to a mother who was incarcerated um, and adopted. Uh, but I was adopted when I was uh, about a year and a half. I was in a series of foster homes and I were in an orphanage. So I, I don't know, but I have a great deal of sympathy for that. Thank I, you. you know, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mark. Thank, you, Thank you, Senator Sears. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Linda. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I was at the orphanage. I, I, I'm going to be 70 years old in a few weeks. I was in the orphanage in 1956. I was there with three other siblings. My younger sister at 18 months old, our, our cots were side by side. I personally had a, a horrific physical abuse uh, attack with a, an, an, a very large nun in a white habit in an empty room and I had an out of body experience. And that's where my memory brings me at that age, about four, four years old. Uh, we were locked in closets, my si younger sister and I. She screamed. I remember the shoes on the shelves in one closet. It's documented on the social workers' paperwork that I recently saw that I told a social worker that my younger sister was put locked in a pantry and was screaming, but yet nobody did anything about it. Having uh, said that, I want you to know that I listened to the panel last week and I found it disturbing to hear that emotional abuse was quickly dismissed because it was hard to prove. As Colonel Potter, Potter would say, hogwash. That is old school thinking. You need to listen to the science as in their new findings. I have, have you listened to it? The new findings of the medical scientists? Vermont has done a very good job when it comes to following the CDC uh, recommendations regarding the pandemic. Neuroscientists no more. If you don't research into this, you are not doing your job correctly. All abuse becomes emotional, no matter what kind of ab abuse it is. It can stop your life. It can slow it down enough that it, it affects your, your progress substantially. Do you know how many employers get away with emotional abuse? How many coworkers get away with, with, uh, with emotional abuse? How families fall apart? Life is evil today and evil is found everywhere. Even in the, the circle 
of politicians right to the top. What does it hurt to include removing statutes of limitations on emotional abuse? It hurts nobody. It can only help someone. Emotional abuse runs wild in institution and large circles of, of, of all kinds rapidly. Don't dismiss providing a victim a way to fight back. Silencing them only digs their pit deeper. Be caring and help. And I want to say one other thing is that with ACEs, the neurons in our brains do not, some of them do not get a chance to develop properly. And we have two muscles one in each side of our brain called the amygdala. And at birth, those muscles start working. They start recording information. So an infant starts recording their, their bad, their adverse experiences in life. And those recordings stay there they do not go away. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Mark? Uh, to Walter. Walter, welcome. You're muted, muted Walt. You're <laughs> muted. Find it well. How's that? Yeah, you got you now. Good job. Okay, thank you. Uh, at 75 years old, I'm not very good with computers. Um, I would like to thank you all for, for coming to listen to us today. I was in St. Joseph's from April 1953 to late 1959, at, what time, at which time I was transferred to Don Bosco across the way. I have many scars from my time at St. Joe's. My knees from where I had to kneel with a Bible in each hand until my knees bled. I have scars on my back from where we had to go out to the grotto where the Virgin Mary was and get a switch so that they could whip us with it. I have scars on the bottom of my penis where a nun burnt me. I was a scared little boy. I was an eight-year-old child put somewhere he should never have been. Back in the 80s to 90s, when this all came out, we were told it could never happen again. I was asked to be respectful of my remarks to you but after all the stuff that came out over St. Joe's and then to have it come out 10 years later over another institution, it just calls me. Yes, I am speaking of Kern Hatton. Someone was responsible for those boys. I understand that none of you were there when we were, but how about last year or the year before, or the year before that? if you let another one slip through the cracks. I have a younger brother. My younger brother is 71 years old. I have at my younger brother, because my stepfather was not Catholic, my younger brother was not put into St. Joseph's, but was put into Kern Hatton. My younger brother refuses to speak about his time at Kern Hatton, which was, I believe, around seven or eight years. I don't know if he was abused there or not because he refuses to speak about it. But when you ask him about it, it's like a light goes out in his eyes. I believe he was abused there, uh, but he won't speak about it. So I can't tell you that he was. Uh, but how did this happen? 
You know, I mean, how did this happen with Kern Had? The same thing that happened at St. Joseph's was at the same time happening at Kern Hatton. The problem my brother has is this all, he was there 60 years ago. So guess what? The statute of limitations affects him today, as well as it affects me. We need to have this changed so that the children who are now adults could come forward and say, this happened to us, we would like it to be remedied. Uh, it's a sad situation when, when we don't do anything about it. The first thing I would have done after this all came out from St. Joseph is given a complete inspection of any place that held children within its walls. I am not trying to put specific blame on anyone, but someone is to blame. You, the state, and us. Yes, I said us. We have, as a group, have pledged ourselves to protect all children. And I do not think we did enough. It is your job, our job, to every minute of every day to make sure our children are safe. When you all go home tonight and your children are safe, make sure they stay that way and never end up like we did. I grew up married and raised three children, raised them in the same way I was raised in St. Joseph's. I am now 75 years old and estranged from two of my children. It is sad, but I knew of no other way. It is too late for me and mine, but please remove these restrictions so that no one can ever hide behind them again. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Um, Mark? Thank you, Walter. Uh, Debbie Hazen. Debbie, uh, you're, you're muted, Debbie. Don't feel bad about being muted, folks. Um, we do it all the time, believe me. Hi, I'm actually Deborah Hayes, and it says Debbie Jeffrey on the screen for some reason. Yeah, you look like a unicorn. Oh, why? <laughs> uh, Debbie, you're you, somehow you muted yourself again. I don't know how. Here we go. Better? Okay, sorry. Did you hear me at all? Yeah. Now. Oh, now we do. <laughs> okay. Oh, my name has changed on the screen now. Good. Um, my name is Deborah Hazen. I was at the orphanage from 1958 to 1964, along with my older brother and an older sister. Um, I remember the day that my dad dropped us off at the orphanage. I was three. And all I can remember is a nun peeling me off of my dad's legs that I was clinging on to so desperately. In the first day, my first full day there, they brought me into a bedroom where the cots are and they taught me how to make a bed. And I had to do that over and over and over and over again until it was to the nun's satisfaction. At three years old, I could do pretty good hospital corners now. Um, yeah, that was very traumatic. Just, I couldn't understand why they were taking me away from my dad. Luckily I had my sister um, for a few months, once you're six years old, you have to move to the next dorm. We were in the second nursery. Walter, we can hear your clocks. There you go. Um, and my sister kind of protected me for a couple of months, but then they took her to the older kids' dorm, so I was kind of left alone and I was terrified. I remember going to bed at six o'clock. We had to sleep on our right side with our hands folded in the prayer position under our cheeks and, and we couldn't move. They put the sheets over our heads. A few minutes later, someone would come around to make sure that we were sleeping. And if we weren't, we were yanked from our beds, late, made to lay on a floor with our pants down waiting for the paddle to strike. That was kind of a, a daily thing. Get up to go to breakfast and they'd have all our cereal sitting in bowls of milk already and it was kind of warm and it was so soggy, it was disgusting. Gagged most of the people. The few kids that couldn't eat it, they would throw up and they were forced to eat their vom their own vomit. I, I witnessed that, so somehow I managed to choke down that cereal. <clears throat> the whole six years we were there, 
my sister, um, the only control she had in her life was to hold her tears. She would not cry in front of those nuns, no matter how they tortured her. She would cry in her pillow at night, nobody knew. But the, um, they, one day, Sister Claire and Sister Madeline took both my sister and I up to the attic. I was very young. I was probably about four, I think. They put me into a trunk and locked me in. And they told me that there was bats and spiders and snakes in there and they were gonna get you. Well, I started screaming hysterically. I was crying and screaming and trying to get out and I couldn't get out. And my sister kept trying to go towards the trunk. Every time she did, they'd grab her by the hair, and lift her head up to see if she was crying. That's all they were trying to do is make her cry. And all of a sudden I just went very quiet. I just stopped crying and Donna thought, my sister thought that I had died because I ran out of air. She thought she killed me. That was the one time in six years that she almost cried in front of the nuns. The nuns, I think, kind of panicked because I went silent, but they finally let me out at that point. Um, yeah, to this day, I, I really still have survivor's guilt, witnessing and hearing all that my sister endured. They did, they did too many things to recount, and yet she still protected me. And to this day, she still fights depression on a daily basis, even sometimes to the point of wanting to commit suicide. It kills me. Um, anytime we were supposedly bad, we weren't bad kids, we were just kids. But if we were bad, we weren't allowed to go see our parents on visiting day and they were, or if we uh, were beaten and had any visible marks or bruises, they held us back from seeing our parents and they told our parents that we were bad and had to work off demerits so we would see them the next two weeks. Um, and we were also told that when we did see our parents, it, that God sees and hears everything. And if you tell your parents what happens in here, God will strike your parents dead. We thought our, our parents were in grave danger, so we never said anything. We just kept our mouths shut. So we never talked about it. There was a room on the second floor, actually two rooms set up for visiting priests and Monsignors. Uh, we called it the red room. There was, there was a red settee as you walked in, red velvet settee. And to the left of that was a desk along the wall with a big ornate, looked like a hand, hand carved wooden chair. But beyond the desk was a door and that was the bedroom. I was brought, a lot of nuns well, I don't know about a lot, but nuns brought kids to them for their sexual pleasure. I was brought to that room along with another child. And I remember at the time, I believe it was a Monsignor in there. And I think he took the other child into the bedroom and my memory stops there. I don't want to remember what happened in there because I know what went on in there. But when I was married to my first husband, he asked me why I wasn't a virgin. I told him I'd never been with any other man. He didn't believe me. He made me feel bad and dirty. I can only imagine what happened in there. My brother too, he, he was molested in there, beaten so many times. We all, we all struggle. Sorry. So you see, these are some good reasons why the statutes and limitations need to be changed, not only for sexual, I know the sexual abuse is already waived, but physical, mental, and emotional abuse as well. It's so very important to all of us to help stop this now and for the children of the future. In closing, this is my little quote. From survivors to saviors, we not only fight for future children, we fight for the child within. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Mark? Debbie, uh, we'll go to Caitlin. Morning, Caitlin. Morning. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was at St. Joseph's in um, 1970 to 1972. I was awarded the state and was not Catholic. Um, and once I got there, I was told by the kids that that meant that I was doomed to hell. Um, I nearly got slapped the 
within the first half hour I was there for not um, understanding something the nun asked me, thinking that it's do something Catholic. Um, the next morning, um, while waiting for the nun to teach me how to make this hospital bed, um, she stopped in the girl's bathroom and um, beat a 10-year-old girl so that she was literally bouncing off the walls. Um, she had a back brace on, which probably enhanced that vision in my head. Um, and um, she just kept beating her, beating her, and she was not careful. She didn't make sure that she didn't hit the, her head on the floor or the um, porcelain sinks or anything. Um, and it was very, very scary. Um, then I um, learned that the nuns, after we were in bed at night, they'd come in and pull girls out of bed after, when they're sleeping and um, beat them. Um, the two nuns were on the floor, both of them would come in. Um, I learned to stay awake at night so that I wouldn't have to wake up to the screams. It was easier, somewhat easier being awake, um, knowing it was gonna happen rather than waking up and hearing it. Um, we were forced to eat anything that was given to us. If we didn't, they'd shove it down our throats. And again, if there, anybody threw up, they were forced to eat the vomit. The nuns considered that as an act of uh, willfulness. Um, um, I was sexually abused there a couple of times, once in the bedroom. Um, I, um, most of the time my job was pots and pans three times a day, but at one point I was put in the second nursery where the two to six year olds were, two to five, six. Um, and I um, had to use a buffing machine on the, on the hallway floor, um, but it got away from my hands the first time I tried using it. And uh, the nun came up behind me and beat me the whole time all the way up to get that buffing machine and get a hold of it, to stop it from bouncing off the walls. Um, there was a three-year-old boy who came in who was beaten by his mother. He saw cuts and bruises in the hospital, pajamas on. One morning, he got up and ran straight into the arms of uh, the nun, and she handed it to me and told me to lock him in the dark menagerie, which was a closet. I went ahead and did it, and I, I felt so guilty almost my whole life since um, doing that to the little boy, but I knew if I didn't, she would hurt him, and it'd be worse for him. I started running away after that. Um, and eventually I ended up uh, trying to kill myself and that got me out of there. But uh, my life pretty much since was in and out of hospitals. Um, and I was never able to like have a family or like have a job or do anything that was like up to my real potential, which is actually quite a bit that I could have done um, if I was able to work things out, but um, no, no kids were believed. Any kids who was told, it, no kid was believed about what happened there. Um, There's physical, emotional abuse every day. They would use kids' fears against them any way that they could. Um, it was like a game to them. And uh, it really has affected me and a lot of other people our whole lives. And I know that there are people who died never ever being able to um, say what happened. And uh, I really don't want um, this to happen to any other person in the future. There's been enough. <clears throat> already. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Mark. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Sears. Uh, Debbie Jeffrey. 
Hi, I'm Debbie Jeffrey. Um, um, I was in the orphanage. From 1964 to 1974, I was two when I went in. I was 12 when I got out. Um, my sister and brother were also placed in the orphanage. Um, we were placed in the orphanage because my um, my father was unable to take care of us, and my mother was was um, inept was mentally ill. Um, someone has to something on. I don't know what it is, Mark. Yeah. Anyhow, um, there's many things that happened to me in the orphanage. Um, I could go on and on. I could go on and on about the red room. Um, I was made to sit in my own feces in a tub for hours. I lived my whole life in fear. Um, every moment was fearful. I still live my life in fear. I can't think of fun. I've been the therapist for many, 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 many years. And um, the only thing that seems to help is this group. Um, my children have suffered immensely due to my fears. I drank my way through my adult life, just to forget. And it didn't work. And I can say now that I haven't had a drink in five years, but the fear is still there. And I realized that the legislature the, the, does not want to open the can, can of worms of emotional abuse. But when you have people that can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt what happened, there should be some way to, to be able to help other people and to be able to be um, verified or whatever the word might be. Uh, my sister suffered immensely she can, she can barely come to the group. My brother committed suicide. He was severely sexually abused, in which, in which point he turned that on me. So not only did I get sexually, emotionally, and everything else abused in that orphanage, when we got out of there, I was also continually abused by my brother. I just hope that you guys hear our voices today. And I thank you so much for taking the time. I think Vermont's doing a great service to everyone by, by taking this up and by um, having the fortitude to listen to us. I am, I'm very grateful for that. And I hope you hear our stories and, and do with it as you will. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Mark. Thank you, Debbie. And we're going to finish with Brenda. <clears throat> My name is Brenda. I was at St. Joseph's Orphanage from 1959 to the summer of 1968. At the age of six, I was brought to St. Joseph's Orphanage and dropped off. All my possessions were taken away, clothes, dolls, toys, never to be seen again. I was changed into their clothes.
a bowl was placed on my head and all my hair cut off. At that time, I became known as inmate number 22. I learned very early that to survive, you had to become invisible. Because when, because when you were visible, the monsters always got you, always. I learned you only had yourself to depend on. No one would help you. I survived. I carry that learning to today, but I'm trying to be more trusting in others. In my healing process, I am also allowing you to see me, to really see me. See the little girl curled up inside of me, hoping to be rescued and saved. No one ever did. See me now, an older woman who still carries that scared child inside of her, still waiting to be rescued and saved. I want you to really see the deep-seated hurt and agony a lot of us live with every day. It never goes away. The, in the incidents of physical abuse to me are still manifesting today. Being beaten around the face, head and neck while tied to a chair because I wouldn't eat peanut butter pudding. Holding my mouth closed and my, my nose closed and forcing my mouth open to put it in there. I spit it out. And the nun beat me so hard around my face, head, and neck. Still tied to the chair, she knocked me across the dining room, tied to the chair so that my head and face slammed into the floor. I was bleeding from my mouth, ears, and nose. They brought me to the ER at that time. And the doctor was looking at me, asking what happened. I couldn't look at him. I had to look at the floor. The nun was sitting there and you could not say anything. She told him I was just a clumsy child. And he was looking at me and he knew that it wasn't something I fell down and did. The record of me in the ER cannot be found. I tried. In my DCF file, there is a hospital bill for medical care at the hospital, but they cannot find the record for that bill. I ended up having to have spinal neck surgery with a fusing and plating in my vertebrae for stability. By being kicked in the stomach and abdominal area many times, I had such scarring and strictures, I was unable to have children. I had to have a complete hysterectomy in my 30s. <laughs> These are just a few of the ongoing medical issues that, that I and many of us continue to have. They are still manifesting today from the treatment, physical abuse at the orphanage. <laughs> I am hoping by our testimony today, it will help you in the writing of this bill help us with our healing and to obtain some justice. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have for us. And thank you for listening to us today. Thank you all. Um, been extremely um, helpful to better understand. I, <clears throat> my one of my questions, Mark, and maybe you can answer and maybe somebody else can answer is, what was the role of the Department of Social Welfare? I think most of you were, uh, at that time it was, uh, now it's DCF, at that time I believe it was DSW. Uh, were they, um, did they place many of you, many of these uh, yes. folks there? And yes. were there social workers who worked with you? Could you tell no. them anything? No, nobody helped. No one. No, nobody helped. Are there records from DSW, Mark? Do you know? Yeah, that so so the uh, department uh, Department of Children and Families at this point did a record search 
Uh, they didn't find records for everybody. They were, were able to find records for about, uh, I'd say about 30% of the active participants in the restorative inquiry. And then uh, working in, in collaboration with them, they create an opportunity for those individuals to view those records. But there are definitely other folks who, who are very clear that they were under state custody at the time who went through the orphanage that they did not find records for. Right. At any time, did any, you were told not to tell your social worker what happened if you had one? Um, is that correct? Um, I, all of you? I, it's documented that I told the social worker that my sister was, 18 month old sister was locked in a pantry screaming. And, and I, I read that, I have that document. And nothing was done, nothing was done. The, um, the Depart um, Department of Children and Families, uh, Jim Forbes uh, did a preliminary investigation into uh, the role of, the, at that point, the Department of Social Work in the orphanage. Uh, and that, that report, I think, is included in the Attorney General's uh, task force report that was released uh, back in December. Uh, but social work practices at that point were very different and there wasn't, there was not, yeah. There was not much checking in on, and there was not much opportunity for children to tell their stories. Thank you. And so the um, group actually is just, I'm sorry, jump in, is meeting with uh, some folks from the commissioner's office now to share their story and, 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 and to the best of their abilities, make sure that uh, DCF practices uh, would capture their stories today in a way that they didn't then. Uh, and so that's an ongoing collaboration between this group and the Department of Children and Families. I know that social workers currently are required to meet with their clients every 30 days at the minimum. And I don't know what the requirements were back in the 60s and 70s um, when many of you were there. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, did you want to comment briefly? Yes. Um, about the only time I saw my social worker was um, oh. Um, when my grandfather died, she picked me up to take me to the funeral. And um, after um, I began running away, oh, after I put that uh, three-year-old boy in the closet, um, and I told her then, like, what had happened. And to her, it was like, just nothing. All she said was that there's no place else for me. Um, even asked to go to the reform school. And she said that... Um, I was too good to go there, um, and there's no place else for me. I had to stay there and just got me switched back to pots and pans rather than working in the second nursery. Um, it was like, I kind of thought she knew. Well, Ma everything, um, Maura has a comment or question. Okay, was she done? Yes. I think so, yeah. Okay, well, my when I told my mom on weekends, about the death of the boy and other things that happened there, my mom would confront the nun and the social workers and they came up with it was only in the eyes of the child. That's all they ever said. Nobody investigated anything. We can't find the boy to this day, no paperwork, nothing. Mm -hmm. um. Other questions for anyone in the group or for Mark from anybody on the committee? I, I thank you all so much for your courage and talking with us today. Um, I don't know, you know, we're, we're gonna continue to look at this tomorrow. We're gonna hear from some folks from Kernatton. Some of you mentioned, um, Walter mentioned his brother had been at Kernatton. Um, we're discovering more and more about that obviously Kern Hatton is still in business. And <clears throat> so there are more recent cases than with St. Joseph. Like um, I, uh, my heart goes out to all of you and thank you for your courage in coming and speaking out. And I hope that at the very least that that is helpful to you and in, in, uh, in healing. Mark, thank you so much for all you do. Do you have any final words, Mark? No, thank you, Senator Sears and the committee members.
members, and, and again, thank you to the participants of the restorative inquiry who, as uh, Senator Sears was referencing, your, your courage is it's just awesome. So thank you. Thank you all.